The front runner in the Tory leadership race, Boris Johnson, says he will take part in the BBC television debate next week. All other candidates had already agreed to take part. The former Foreign Secretary had faced accusations of avoiding media scrutiny. What I think the best solution would be would be to have a, a debate on uh, what we all have to offer the country, our programme to take uh, Britain forward. Earlier, the Health Secretary Matt Hancock dropped out of the contest. It leaves six candidates going through to next week's ballot. We'll have the very latest on all of that live from Westminster. Also this lunchtime. Two years after the Grenfell Tower fire, a service of remembrance is held for the 72 people who lost their lives. Many of you will never feel that you can truly rest until justice has been served. You're not alone in your struggle. We all stand with you. Heavy rain continues to cause flooding and landslips in parts of England. A military helicopter had to be deployed to shore up a riverbank. And it's a big day for the home nations at the Women's World Cup. Scotland are about to take on Japan. England face Argentina this evening. And coming up on BBC News, will England build on a good start in the field against West Indies in their Cricket World Cup clash in Southampton? Good afternoon. Welcome to the BBC News at One. Boris Johnson, the front runner in the race to be the Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister, says he will now take part in the BBC television debate with the other contenders next Tuesday. The former Foreign Secretary had been under pressure to do so after being accused of avoiding media scrutiny. Meanwhile, the Health Secretary Matt Hancock has announced he is dropping out of the contest. After the first ballot, Mr Hancock was in sixth place with 20 votes with Boris Johnson, the standout winner, with 114 votes. This means there are now six candidates who go through to the second ballot next week. Let's get the very latest from our political correspondent, Chris Mason, following all of this at Westminster. Chris. Jane, there is a seriousness of purpose and an organisation around Boris Johnson's pitch for the top job this time that wasn't there three years ago. But there's also a caution, a caution about moments where he could slip up. But his team knew that if he avoided all public scrutiny uh, during this campaign and he was to win, there'd be even bigger questions about his legitimacy uh, when or if he moves in uh, to Downing Street. Meanwhile, the number of contenders in this race has fallen by another, another dropout this morning. Here is the story of the morning. Lights, camera and the end of the action for Matt Hancock. His attempt to be Prime Minister is over. Where I have put myself forward as a candidate focused on the future, the parties understandably focus very much on the here and now and how we get through uh, Brexit in the next few months. And so I've decided to withdraw from the contest uh, and I'll be looking for how I can make those values sing and make sure that the party encapsulates the values that are so important. Also, I really want. And take a look at this. Mr. Hancock socking it to leadership contender Dominic Raab. This is what a feminist looks like. Morning, Mr. Johnson. And this is what the front runner looks like. And the big question he's facing. Are you afraid of scrutiny or a gaffe, Mr. Johnson? All the other candidates say Mr. Johnson must take part in TV debates, including one on Channel 4 on Sunday evening. It's incredibly important because he is by far the front runner in this race. He's going to be the person in the final two and the real judgment the members of parliament have to make is who do they want going up against Boris in the final two and there's only one way they can judge that which is by seeing Boris on the stage against the other candidates. Public hustings is not the same as the scrutiny of the media, the scrutiny of TV debates. This is about the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I mean, what would Churchill say if uh, someone who wants to be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is hiding away from the media, not taking part in these big occasions? And to next, the former Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab, the candidate who says he's not a feminist. Oh, and nothing says a politician doing a photo opportunity more 
than a fluorescent jacket. I'm looking forward on building up some momentum and in particular testing the vision, the ideas and the policies of all the candidates in these first TV debates on Sunday. It's a great opportunity for me. And after a morning of questions from his rivals, this from Mr Johnson. Yes to a BBC debate on Tuesday, but no commitment to Sunday's Channel 4 programme. In the past, when you've had loads of, of candidates, it can be slightly cacophonous. And I think the public have had a quite a lot of blue-on-blue uh, -blue action, frankly, over the last three years. We don't necessarily need a lot more of that. Here's the prize he and the others are chasing, moving in here in just over a month. And crucially, Jane, that BBC debate next Tuesday evening is after the next round of voting, when the list of contestants will have shrunk still further. This contest is hotting up. Chris, thank you. Chris Mason at Westminster. Well, meanwhile, Chuka Amuna, who left Labour earlier this year to help form the Change UK party, has joined the Liberal Democrats. Speaking in the last half an hour, the former shadow business secretary said he was absolutely delighted to have joined the party. Earlier, he admitted he had massively underestimated the difficulty of setting up a new political party. A church service has been held to mark the second anniversary of the Grenfell Tower fire in which 72 people died. Later, survivors and the bereaved will lay a wreath at the foot of the tower in West London and hold a vigil to remember those who lost their lives. But two years on from the disaster, three quarters of tall buildings in England with cladding categorised as unsafe still haven't had it removed or modified. Sarah Campbell reports. Lit up in memory of all those who died, and for a community still living with the scars of the fire. Covered in a screen, but the remains of the tower still dominate this corner of London. Two years on, the community has come together once again to remember. Nabil Shuker lost six members of his family that night. It's, it's to make sure that they're now never forgotten. It's also to so that we all um, give our prayers to all the 72 members, get in the community all together um, and ensuring um, that we will stick by each other year after year until we get the justice and what we're looking for. Sainam Chikan, Miana Chikan. Whole families Fatima gone, Chikan. young and old. Mary Mendy. All 72 were named this morning in St Helens Church Gary in a service Andrews. described as of remembrance Deborah and resilience. Andrea. Forever in our hearts. But I know a change is gonna come. Ooh, yes, it will. At 12 noon, 72 seconds of silence. Public inquiry into what happened is ongoing and will be for some time. The frustrations of many were voiced here today. It is, nor should be, a matter of national shame that Grenfell Tower was allowed to get to the state or a small fire in a faulty fridge on the fourth floor could cause so much devastation. The two years on, we seem still no clearer on where responsibility lies and where buildings across the country are still covered in cladding similar to that which seems to have caused the fire here. This was a service by and for a community whose members have tried so hard to help each other over the last two years. Sarah Campbell, BBC News. Well, let's also talk to our Home Affairs correspondent, Tom Simons, who is with me. And in terms of cladding on buildings, 
two years on and still so many not changed, not modified. What, what's driving that? Yeah, I mean, work hasn't even started on 221 buildings, which I think is a real issue. And, and uh, people who live in these buildings are having to pay for, for example, a waking watch throughout the night and day so that if there is a fire, everybody can be warned. I think there are lots of reasons. One is this is quite uh, technical stuff. These cladding installations are not just bits of plastic or, or metal on the side of a building. There's a whole system around them. That's expensive to remove and redesign. Uh, I think there is a financial issue. I think there's the ownership of the buildings, which varies in, in, a, in a great deal of cases. Uh, and I think the biggest amount of work is in private uh, buildings where there are often standoffs between the people who own the building and the people who live in the building but are leaseholders and leaseholders will tell you they are getting huge bills uh, uh, put in front of them to replace the cladding. Now the government has made 200 million pounds available for those private buildings but most of the people I've spoken to who are involved in this who own flats where cladding needs to come down say it's just not enough. Uh, it doesn't go towards all of the buildings that need the work and there's another problem as well. There are concerns about other types of cladding, not the ones used at Grenfell, and the government has only just started testing those. Tom Simons, thank you. Flood warnings are still in place in parts of the Midlands and northwest of England as heavy rain continues to cause problems. About 400 passengers were stranded on a train near Corby for eight hours after a landslide caused by flooding blocked the line. And a military helicopter was called in to help shore up a riverbank in Lincolnshire after heavy rain. Phil Mackey has the latest details. The RAF has spent the night trying to repair a breach in flood defences on the River Steeping which has caused severe flooding in Wainfleet to more than 70 homes, and that number could rise. Police say it's one of the most challenging emergencies that the county's ever faced. It's been three days of, of pain uh, for those communities in Wainfleet. Uh, to discover that your house has been flooded is, of course, really upsetting. They've been fantastic. Some of the heroic efforts by those fire rescue officers, a real challenging operation here in Lincolnshire. Really Rail passengers had to be rescued near Corby last night after first one and then a second train became trapped by flooding and a landslide. It's been a week when it seemed like it would never stop raining, which would be less of a problem if it weren't the middle of June. It is unusual and we've got a lot of people uh, by rivers who, who perhaps wouldn't normally be on holiday, camping, that kind of stuff. And, you know, what we're urging is people, if you are if you are near rivers, they are very high, they're very swollen, they're reacting very quick to rain, increased vigilance, you know, be very careful about your surroundings. The rain is easing off and the forecast is a little bit better, but the rivers are still filling up. And the peak here in Worcester isn't expected until late tomorrow afternoon which means the disruption is going to continue for a few more days. And those with weekend plans will just have to make the best of it, which will suit some more than others. Phil Mackey, BBC News, Worcester. A couple has been found guilty of murdering a vulnerable young woman in Inverclyde more than 18 years ago. One of them was also found guilty of fraudulently collecting her benefits worth £182,000. A jury at the High Court in Glasgow convicted Edward Kearney and Avril Jones of killing 19-year-old Margaret Fleming between December 1999 and January 2000. Her body has never been found. Lorna Gordon joins me from the court. A very distressing case. Lorna, tell us more. Yes, it is. Margaret Fleming was last seen alive around Christmas 1999, but it was 16 years before anyone realised that she was missing. The couple, her supposed carers, who were meant to be looking after her, concocted a web of lies to cover up their crimes. After the murder, they travelled to London and typed up and posted letters which were said to be from Margaret. The prosecution here at the High Court in Glasgow Glasgow, though, was able to show it was not the teenager who had written the letters. But then, when they were finally questioned about her whereabouts, uh, they made up fantastical claims as to where she'd gone. They said she was a wannabe spy, that she was a gang master, that she had run away from the police because she was afraid. The jury here, though, did not believe them. This morning, in the last few minutes, they found them guilty of murder and they will be sentenced next month. Lorna Gordon, thank you. 
Iran says it categorically rejects U.S. claims that it was behind attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the type of weapons used indicates Iranian forces were involved. It is the second such attack on tankers using the strategically important waterway, which separates Iran from the Arabian Peninsula, in the last month. Crude oil prices have risen in response. Jonathan Beale reports. Is this proof of Iran trying to remove evidence from one of the two tankers targeted in the Gulf? America says their video shows Iran's Revolutionary Guard taking away an unexploded mine which the US believes they'd planted on one of the ships. The US Navy also released these photos taken earlier of the same ship, one arrow pointing to where they believe a mine exploded and the other where they think the mine was still attached. America has no doubt Iran was behind these attacks on a critical shipping route. Britain says it'll study the evidence, but it too is pointing the finger at Iran. We have no reason uh, not to believe the American assessment, and our instinct is to believe it because they're our closest ally, and we are very worried about the situation in Iran. Iran still denying it. This morning in a tweet, their foreign minister accused the US of jumping to make allegations without a shred of evidence. What is clear is that tensions are rising. With Iran angered by America's re-imposition of sanctions over its nuclear program and the US beefing up its military presence in the region. Neither side says they want a war, but the United States is stressing it's ready to defend its interests. Jonathan Beale, BBC News. Now, in the next hour, Scotland takes our attention to the weather, <laughs> if we dare. Louise Lear, hello. Hello there, Jane. Do you know, this time last week I was moaning because my garden was desperate for rain. Ugh. That was the kiss of death, wasn't it? Be careful what you wish for. It's been a miserable week for most of us. Record-breaking rainfall for some, believe it or not, in Northumberland earlier on this week. And some of us have seen close to three months' worth of rain. And with that rain, it's been disappointingly cold, hasn't it, really, for the time of year. I can offer you something a little bit more optimistic, though, into next week. Drier for most of us. There still will be some rain around, but certainly more sunshine than we've seen this week. And... As a result, just that little bit warmer as well. But for the time being, we're still under that influence of low pressure. It's going to stay with us into the weekend and spiralling around the low like a Catherine wheel, a series of weather fronts that continue to bring in some showery outbreaks of rain across the country. So for the rest of the afternoon, still quite a lot of cloud around, I'm afraid, and bits and pieces of showery rain. One moving through the Midlands up into eastern England, another across Northern Ireland and into western Scotland. We keep mostly cloudy, but if you get a few glimpses of sunshine, particularly favoured spots in the southeast, temperatures will be a degree or so higher than of late. Maybe, even if we're lucky, 20 degrees at 68 Fahrenheit. Now, as we move through this evening, we keep that rain out into the west, and in fact, the next band of rain will push in and gather, and that'll become more intense. Eastern areas stay relatively dry, so we start off our Saturday morning on a relatively sunny note across the eastern half of the UK. But this weekend, we've still got that low with us, and we will still see weather fronts moving in, particularly the further north and west you are. So on Saturday, western areas will start off cloudy with outbreaks of rain. Early morning sunshine eventually will cloud over across many eastern half of the UK. And we'll see that weather front, a fairly weak affair, moving its way through the spine of the country by the middle part of the day. Temperatures ranging between 15 and 19 Celsius. Now that front will move its way eastwards, bringing a little bit of showery rain overnight. And then as we move into Sunday, closest to the low pr pressure, so western Scotland, northern Ireland, maybe western fringes, will continue to see some showers. So the further east you live, the best of the drier, brighter weather you will get. And again, those temperatures perhaps into the high teens. If we're lucky, we'll see 20 degrees. But into the early half of next week, we then draw in this area of high pressure influencing the story across the near continent and southerly winds are likely to take over. So for many of us, we will see a good deal of dry weather in the forecast, may even get pretty warm into the southeast. Just Wednesday, we could see a brief hiccup with a little more rain, but certainly in comparison to this week, much better. Jane. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Louise Lear. And just a reminder of our main story here this lunchtime. The front runner in the Tory leadership race, Boris Johnson, says he will take part in the BBC TV debate next week. The former Foreign Secretary had been accused by some of avoiding media scrutiny. 
And that is all for today from the BBC News at One team. Goodbye from everyone here on BBC One. Let's join the BBC's news teams wherever you are. Enjoy your afternoon. Bye-bye. Hello, very good afternoon to you. You are watching BBC News. The time is just edging up to half past one. I'm Jane Hill. Let's have a reminder of the main news stories here this lunchtime. And the leading contender for the Tory leadership, Boris Johnson, says he will take part in a televised debate on the BBC on Tuesday evening. What I think the best solution would be would be to have a, a debate on what we all have to offer the country, our programme to take Britain forward. Meanwhile, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has dropped out of the race. So far, he hasn't said which of the remaining six candidates he'll be giving his backing to. In other news, two years on from the Grenfell Tower fire, survivors and relatives of the 72 people who died have come together to remember the tragedy. The US releases a video which it says proves Iran was behind attacks on two tankers in the Gulf of Oman. It claims that Iran's Revolutionary Guards can be seen removing an unexploded mine from the side of one of the vessels. Hundreds of passengers had to be rescued from a train overnight after heavy rain caused a landslide and widespread flooding in Northamptonshire. And the weather still causing huge problems for an awful lot of people. We'll have the very latest just before two o'clock. Uh, right now, though, let's return to that story that's been dominating the Conservative Party leadership race, of course. In the last uh, half an hour or so, Boris Johnson has given an extensive interview to Mark Mardell on BBC Radio 4's The World at One. So let's hear what the former Foreign Secretary had to say. I've always been keen on TV debates and slightly bewildered uh, by the, the conversation that's been going on because I think it is important that we have a, a sensible grown-up debate. And my own observation is that I think in the past, when you've had loads of, of candidates, it can be slightly cacophonous. And I think the public have had a quite a lot of blue-on-blue uh, -blue action, frankly, over the last three years. We don't necessarily need a lot more of that. And so what I think the best solution would be would be to have a, a debate on uh, what we all have to offer the country, our programme to take Britain forward, our pro my programme to unite the country. And the best uh, time to do that, I think, would be after the second ballot on Tuesday. And the best forum is the, the, the BBC, the proposed BBC uh, debate. I think that's a good idea. Well, there are all sorts of invitations. I must have received dozens and dozens of invitations to do hustings here, there and everywhere and debates of all kinds. But as I say, I think there can be a risk of not only a slight cacophony when you have lots and lots of, of candidates, but also uh, the impression of yet more uh, blue on blue action when I think what the public want to hear is a, a serious... And that, yeah, Mark, what I'm saying is I, I've, I'm very keen on TV debates and it did, it did many, many, if people remember, in the run-up to the London mayoral elections, I think by the end a certain sort of narcolepsy had descended on the TV audience. Uh, and uh, so, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to do the, the BBC TV debate on Tuesday. Well, look, I think people will always try to find a kind of uh, a moment when they can say that they've they've tripped me up or got me or uh, forced me into some gaff or, a, or indiscretion or, or error of some kind. But I will continue to be the kind of politician I've been for a very long time. And that is somebody who believes passionately in his ideas, somebody I want to take this country forward. I think we have some fantastic projects now uh, going on to uh, unite the UK with infrastructure, uh, with education, 
uh, with technology. In a nutshell, what I want to do uh, in the UK is, is, is do, in a sense, uh, what we did in London to try to unite our society and, and bring it together. And yes, if, 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 sometimes, if sometimes I say things that cause, you know, a, 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 a fluttering in the dovecots or a plaster to come off the ceiling, uh, if it gets people's attention, if it interests them in politics, Mark, then I think that is no bad thing. So that was Boris Johnson speaking on The World at One on BBC Radio 4 just in the last half an hour or so. Uh, and key among that interview, of course, the news that he will take part in the television debate on Tuesday evening. That's the one on Tuesday evening. There's another one before that. Uh, but the BBC one is on Tuesday evening and that is the one he has said he will be taking part in. That's all after he did come under some pressure to do so. All the other candidates had already agreed to take part, uh, but he was telling the world at one that he will now be part of that programme. Well, as uh, staying with the Tory leadership race, because we've also been reporting this morning that the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has decided to pull out of the contest. Uh, in the first round of voting, he came six with 20 votes. And his withdrawal means that there are six candidates now still in the race. And he said he's talking to the other contenders, but hasn't yet endorsed anyone else at this stage. He's been speaking to our deputy political editor, John Pienaar. So, Matt Hancock, what have you decided and why? Well, I've been incredibly uh, encouraged and uh, humbled by the amount of support that I've had in this campaign. And I've tried to make the argument about the values that the Conservative Party needs to hold dear, of free enterprise and support for a free society and being open and optimistic and enthusiastic about the future. Um, but the party clearly is looking for a candidate to deal with the here and now. Um, I very much put myself forward as the a candidate focused on the future. And so I've decided to withdraw from the race and instead see how best I can advance those values uh, within the party uh, and, the, and the big and difficult task that we've got ahead. So uh, obviously a great disappointment to have to pull out in this way. Well, naturally, um, you know, you, you enter these contests in order to win. Um, and I've also tried to make that happen on the values that I care about and really making the argument about the things that matter. You know, the Conservative Party always needs to be pro-business, pro-enterprise. And I think that I've, uh, I've been winning that argument and more and more other candidates are starting to say these things. Uh, and that we need to be open and attracting voters from the centre ground, voters who might be voting for other parties, like uh, thinking about voting for the Labour Party and Lib Dems. And now the other candidates are also making those arguments. So I feel like I've been winning arguments, uh, but it's also clear that where I have put myself forward as a candidate focused on the future, the parties understandably focus very much on the here and now and how we get through uh, Brexit in the next few months. And so I've decided to withdraw from the contest uh, and I'll be looking for how I can make those values sing and make sure that the party encapsulates the values that are so important. So who are you going to endorse now? Who are you going to back? Well, I'm talking to all of the other candidates uh, and um, I've set out very clearly both in the campaign uh, and um, now as I withdraw from the campaign what really matters in terms of being pro-business, pro-enterprise and uh, a politics that brings people together. And I'll be talking to all the other candidates about uh, how they can best do that. What then will you focus on, your values, as you say? What should the party focus on, by way of values, as it decides who to back from here on? Well, obviously, I'll be uh, focusing on my uh, day job as being health secretary and also on making sure that in this contest, it's the ideas of being um, uh, aspirational, uh, entrepreneurial, pro-enterprise, pro-business, uh, of really valuing every individual in society and having policies to support people to make the most of their lives. These are the things that I really care about. That's what I'm going to be focused on. So therefore, when it comes to Europe, from everything you said, the party should not look towards someone who is in any way, I don't know, enthusiastic or, or, or unaware of the dangers of leaving without a deal. That would be a big warning of yours. 
Well, I've always been clear that the big risk is in Parliament, which has been uh, made it perfectly obvious in the past that it would stop a no-deal Brexit. We need to deliver Brexit, and the best way to do that is with a deal. You know, I've made that case uh, pretty strongly over the past um, few weeks in this contest, and indeed over the past few months and years since the referendum. Uh, and I look forward to supporting the party and in order to try to do that and to deliver Brexit, and then we can move forwards. So you would urge the party then on that to look away from the candidates, Boris Johnson, Dominic Raab, who say they will leave on October the 31st, deal or no deal? No, I'm, I'm not saying anything about the other candidates. I think I, there are admirable qualities to all of my colleagues who are, who are running. Uh, and um, I've always been clear that uh, the party needs to come together, the government needs to come together, ultimately the country needs to come together after this contest, and we need to look forward. So I'll, con I'll think about how best we can advance the values that I care so much about, and I'll make a comment about uh, how to do that in the, in the days to come. But you would say it would be wrong to, to look at leaving on October 31st, deal or no deal, come what may. You would say that would be the wrong way to go. And would you urge the party to look away from that option? Well, I've always made the case that the risk that was demonstrated before 29th of March, when we were meant to leave, the risk is that Parliament stops that from happening. That's always been my argument. Um, and um, I've then tried to make the case about what we need to be doing in the future and where we need to be going as a country, making sure that post-Brexit Britain is open and international and engaged with the whole world and a, uh, a, a bastion of, uh, of, of enterprise and, of, uh, uh, and supporting people to meet their but the aspirations. Most important thing, the most important thing for you would be to get a deal for as long as that necessarily takes. Well, I think that the best way to deliver Brexit is with a deal on the 31st of October, meeting our commitments to deliver the result of the referendum in a way that supports uh, the economy and supports people, uh, and, um, uh, and then we can move forward. But if it takes longer than that then for you, so be it. Well, I'm not going to resolve from anything I said in the campaign. I mean, you know, I made my case uh, clearly. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the thing I really stood for in the campaign was tr trying to cast this contest forward. Um, and it's, but it's clear that the party is understandably concentrating on what we need to do right in the here and now. OK, just a final thought on the, the magnitude of the choice now facing the Conservative Party and the country, the implications for the country. We are, are we, at a moment of, of risk, possibly of danger, a defining moment? We do stand, we stand at a defining moment in our country's history. That's absolutely true. Um, and I'm clear about how we need to get through it. Um, we need to deliver Brexit and then we need to cast forward and try to bring the country together. That's, a, that's the goal. Is it a moment of risk or even danger? Would that be fair? Well, it's, it's clearly an incredibly important moment to get right and it's also a very difficult moment to get right. Uh, and, um, you know, the, I, I'm very clear about the values that I have promoted and want to promote. Uh, and I think they're very important for the party, but they're also very, very important for the country. And it's about bringing the uh, country together. But ultimately, we also need the, uh, you know, here in Parliament, the Conservative Party to come together after this, because that is the best way to deliver for, the, for our constituents, for the, for the citizens of this country. Television debates coming up, they will be important whatever happens. Yeah. What would you say about Boris Johnson's apparent reluctance to commit? Well, I've said all along, I think all the, contest, the contestants uh, should be uh, in the uh, TV debates. I think that there should be scrutiny. Uh, I've, uh, I think, you know, because of the nature of this contest is that the, the, it isn't just to be the leader of the Conservative Party. It's to be the next Prime Minister. And so that scrutiny is important. What does it say about Boris that he has not committed? Well, as I say, I think all the contestants should, uh, uh, should put themselves forward for scrutiny.
Well, uh, and as you will gather, that was Matt Hancock speaking just a little earlier this morning to John Pienaar before Boris Johnson said that he will indeed certainly take part in the BBC television debate, which is on Tuesday evening. Uh, Matt Hancock withdrawing from the Conservative Party race, leaving six candidates still in the running. A couple have been found guilty of murdering a vulnerable young woman in Inverclyde more than 18 years ago. One of them was also found guilty of fraudulently collecting her benefits worth £182,000. A jury at the High Court in Glasgow convicted Edward Kearney and Avril Jones of killing 19-year-old Margaret Fleming between December 1999 and January 2000. Margaret Fleming's body has never been found. Well, Detective Superintendent Paul Livingston is the senior investigating officer in the case and he gave this statement to journalists a short while ago. It's horrific and the conditions in which she lived were utterly disgusting and uninhabitable. For Kelly and Jones to continue the charade that, was still, that she was still alive for all these years is absolutely abhorrent, with one of the reasons being for financial gain. We'll never know just how Margaret was killed. What we do know is that she lived her last, last days in what can only be described as a living hell. She must have felt that she was alone in the world with no one coming to help her, which is just absolutely heartbreaking to think of. All of the detectives who worked on this complex inquiry were resolute in their aim to secure justice for Margaret. They wanted to be the advocate that Margaret never had. Margaret was just a young woman when she was murdered. Who knows what she might have went on to achieve in her life if it hadn't been ended so prematurely at the evil and greedy hands of Kelly and Jones. Thank you. Detective Superintendent Paul Livingston speaking outside court in the last hour. Two people convicted of murder. They have not yet been sentenced. Convicted of killing Margaret Fleming. In a moment, we'll have all the latest business news this hour with Jamie. First, just a reminder of today's headlines. The front runner in the Tory leadership race, Boris Johnson, says he will take part in the BBC televised debate next week. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has dropped out of the Conservative leadership race, meanwhile. So far, he hasn't said which of the remaining six candidates he's going to give his backing to. And two years on from the Grenfell Tower fire, survivors and relatives of the 72 people who died have come together to remember the tragedy. Good afternoon, I'm Jamie Robertson. Business news now. Uh, as we've been hearing, a ban on adverts featuring harmful gender stereotypes, or those which are likely to cause serious or widespread offence, has come into force today. The ban covers scenarios such as a man with his feet up while a woman cleans, or a woman failing to park a car. If you have shares of a construction firm, Kia, I'm afraid they've lost about 11% of their value this morning. The fall comes after reports from the Times it's looking to sell its house building division for between 100 and 150 million pounds. Now, normally it would seem fairly good price, but analysts are saying that price would actually be disappointing. Oil price falls back after yesterday's sudden spike. That was following the attack on tankers in the Gulf of Oman. Traders now, though, starting to worry about global oversupply. Right, nearly all of us want harmful content taken off social media. We know it's there. Almost half of all teenagers have seen something harmful on social media in the last month or so. The problem is none of us are doing anything about it. The Chartered Institute of Marketing says two-thirds, about 62%, of children say they rarely or never report uh, harmful posts. Only 7% say they always do. Now this is important for business as well because it gives social media a bad reputation, it lessens its appeal as a marketing tool, you know, who wants their brand to appear unwittingly next to disturbing images. Now we're joined by Lee Hopwood who's chair of uh, Charles Institute of Marketing who's been researching this matter. Uh, Lee, uh, let's just get the, the basic facts right. What, are, what do we mean when we talk about harmful images? Uh, well, really, harmful images are uh, anything from uh, anything that might be sexually related or terrorist related, but it's not just harmful images, it's harmful video content, it's bullying, it's abuse. There's uh, lots of uh, ways that harmful content is being uh, uh, displayed on social media when it shouldn't be. OK, so why don't people report this? Why, why is such a large number of teenagers see it, they know they don't like it, but they don't do anything about it? Well, I think there's a number of things. 
to be honest, I don't think the social media companies make it easy to report harmful content and I think they could make it a lot easier by making those report buttons one available and two much more accessible. But I also think, and one of the reasons why I'm here today, is because we need to make it much more aware to the public that we should be reporting content. I think there is a, the government needs to do a public awareness campaign to make sure that we as, as individuals, as parents, are reporting that content and that we are, are let, making sure that our children are reporting that content. Children are less likely to report content than adults. So the government uh, has, has tr now said that if people complain about something, then that, that, that the social media companies have to take it down. But you're saying that's simply not going to work if we don't go do that first process of, of reporting it. Absolutely. So the government is uh, putting forward a proposal to say uh, what the social media companies need to do. However, they need to get their people, their processes, their technologies in place to be able to respond to what could be a huge wave once they start enabling people to report that content far easier. Now, surely there's a business, the, the business angle here is important because surely a social media company wants to attract advertising, wants to get its advertisers there. But if it has a reputation of doing nothing about uh, harmful images, those advertisers are going to be scared away. So it's got a real incentive. The social media companies have a real incentive of keeping the place clean, as it were. Absolutely. I mean, so why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it work? Well, I, I think the, um, the, the social media companies are obviously focused on their, their revenues. They want to see their revenues. I think there is uh, such an increase and quite a rapid increase in the number of people that are starting to disengage with social media. And I think that the danger is that if social media companies don't embrace what's inevitable, then, uh, then, then they'll end up disengaging their, peop their, their users. And if their, their users aren't there, then the, the companies that are spending money, £52 billion a year on social media, those companies will, will simply start looking at how they can spend their money elsewhere to engage with their customers. OK, Lee. Uh, very good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, Lee. Hopefully Thank you very much. Uh, let's have a quick look at the markets before we go. Uh, FTSE's down a little bit, not a huge amount. Kia Group, um, that's because of the uh, 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 report they're saying they're going to be selling off part of their building business, and that is uh, worrying the um, uh, a worrying analyst saying that's really a pretty disappointing figure that they're hoping for. Oil, very bizarre market at the moment. We're getting it going up and down. Obviously, we went up as a result of those oil tanker attacks and worries about tension in the Middle East. But on the other hand, we do have concerns about oversupply in the world generally and a global slowdown in growth. And if you're getting growth slowing down to trade wars and all the rest of it, which we've talked about so many times on this programme, if you've got that going on, you've got less demand for oil and therefore the uh, oil price is likely to come down. So you're going to see the price really volatile around that $60 level. Could go up, could go down. Very unpredictable. A pound against euro, 112.31. That's it. That's the business news. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you. Now, let's talk about the toy industry, which is massive. Last year, 370 million toys were sold in the UK alone. And while unwanted toys do get passed on to younger children, their component parts make them difficult to recycle. It means many end up in landfill. So how can we get children to think about the amount of plastic they're playing with without spoiling their fun? The actress and Greenpeace campaigner Bonnie Wright has been investigating in a special report for BBC Radio 5 Live. Kids always want the, the, the next hot thing, but they will, they will have that thought, and then a lot of them are like, oh, actually, do I need that? And they're very, very mindful. I've never really 
thought about toys mm -hmm. as being part of the problem. Whether I would restrict her from having a toy because it was made of plastic, I don't know. What do you say to Bonnie for coming to Aswell today? Thank you! Oh, thanks for having me. I can, you think I can be an honorary member of your uh, committee? Yes. yes! They seem just, yeah, genuinely concerned and that they want to sort of use their imagination on how to solve the issue. <laughs> Multiple hands! I hope that you know, these toy companies maybe think differently about maybe what children want these days. Bonnie Wright with that report for Radio 5 Live. Shops offering tattoos and piercings pose an infection risk and laws about who can work in them should be tightened. That's according to a leading public health charity. The Royal Society for Public Health says one in five adults in the UK now has a tattoo and more should be done to protect them. Here's our health correspondent Dominic Hughes. For most people, getting a tattoo or a piercing is a straightforward procedure. But there are health risks whenever the barrier that is formed by our skin is broken. And health experts say not enough is being done to prevent infection. The whole desire for body modification is something that's uh, grown in the last uh, couple of decades as people become you know, more interested in, in their body image. Um, and that's great, but um, the legislation just hasn't caught up. And we'd like to see a level playing field, basically. I think, I think it would be useful for anyone in the UK to, to know that wherever they're going, um, they, they can be assured that the person who's giving them a special procedure, such as a tattoo, is suitably qualified in infection control, um, and so that it really does minimise the risk of side effects. The number of shops offering tattoos and piercings has rocketed in recent years, up by more than 170% in just a decade. One in five of us now has a tattoo. But in a survey of more than 800 people who were tattooed, pierced or underwent acupuncture or electrolysis in the last five years, 18% reported negative side effects. Wales is the only part of the UK where a compulsory licensing scheme for tattoo parlours and others offering similar services is being introduced. Today's report says that not enough is being done in the rest of the country to protect the public from potentially serious infection. Dominic Hughes, BBC News. Much more coming up from two o'clock with Simon McCoy right now. Let's have a look at the weather prospects. Louise Lear has the latest. Hello there. I think it's pretty fair to say that most of us will probably be glad to see the back of this week with that heavy, persistent rain. For some, in Northumberland on Wednesday, we had some record-breaking rainfall totals. Some of us have seen nearly three months' worth of rain, and it's been quite cold, particularly for June. But I'm pleased to say as we move into next week, we will see an improvement. Drier for most of us. There's still going to be some rain around, but nowhere near as bad as this week. More sunshine and just feeling that little bit warmer as well. Before then, we're still under the influence of low pressure, as you can see quite clearly, and spiralling like a Catherine wheel around that low bands of weather fronts bringing some showery outbreaks of rain. So the story so far today has seen some rain that's starting to weaken as it moves its way through the Midlands and up into eastern England and some showers as well through western Scotland and Northern Ireland. That will be the case as we run into the afternoon. So some of us will continue to see some spells of sunshine and as a result it'll feel a little warmer. Highest values of 13 to 20 degrees in the southeast corner. That's 68 Fahrenheit. Through the night tonight, we'll see a band of more persistent rain starting to push in with another frontal system from the west. So we will start off our Saturday morning with a little bit of a west-east divide as this frontal system, still under the influence of that low pressure, continues to threaten. So western areas starting off on Saturday, cloudy with some rain at times. Sheltered eastern areas, you might have some early morning sunshine, eventually clouding over as we go into the afternoon, a few showers ahead of that frontal rain, and as it will push its way into eastern England, the Midlands, down to the south coast by the middle of the afternoon. But again, a weaker affair by then, showery outbreaks of rain. Still that area of low pressure with us on Sunday, just to the northwest, and still the potential for some fronts to move in. But Generally speaking, on Sunday, it's a case of sunny spells and scattered showers, and most of those showers will be closest to that low up into the northwest. So western areas, particularly Scotland and Northern Ireland, seeing some pretty heavy showers at times. Sheltered south and eastern areas, seeing more sunshine and, again, a little more in the way of warmth. But I did promise you something a little bit more optimistic as we move into next week. It could get pretty warm in the south. Just a blip with some rain through the middle part of the week, but much better than the week we had.